Chapter One of Black Beauty. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Samuel. Black Beauty, His Grooms and Companions, The Autobiography of a Horse, translated from the original Equine by Anna Sewell. Part One, Chapter One. My early home. The first place that I can well remember was a large, pleasant meadow, with a pond of clear water in it. Some shady trees leaned over it, and rushes and water lilies grew at the deep end. Over the hedge on one side we looked into a ploughed field, and on the other we looked over a gate at our master's house, which stood by the roadside. At the top of the meadow was a grove of fir trees, and at the bottom a running brook overhung by a steep bank. While I was young, I lived upon my mother's milk, as I could not eat grass. In the daytime, I ran by her side, and at night I lay down close by her. When it was hot, we used to stand by the pond in the shade of the trees, and when it was cold, we had a nice warm shed near the grove. As soon as I was old enough to eat grass, my mother used to go out to work in the daytime and come back in the evening. There were six young colts in the meadow besides me. They were older than I was. Some were nearly as large as grown-up horses. I used to run with them and had great fun. We used to gallop all together round and round the field as hard as we could go. Sometimes we had rather rough play, for they would frequently bite and kick as well as gallop. One day, when there was a good deal of kicking, my mother whinnied to me to come to her, and then she said, "I wish you to pay attention to what I am going to say to you. The colts who live here are very good colts, but they are cart horse colts, and of course they have not learned manners. You have been well bred and well born. Your father has a great name in these parts, and your grandfather won the cup two years at the Newmarket races." Your grandmother had the sweetest temper of any horse I ever knew, and I think you have never seen me kick or bite. I hope you will grow up gentle and good, and never learn bad ways. Do your work with a good will, lift your feet up well when you trot, and never bite or kick, even in play. I have never forgotten my mother's advice. I knew she was a wise old horse, and our master thought a great deal of her. Her name was Duchess, but he often called her Pet. Our master was a good, kind man. He gave us good food, good lodging, and kind words. He spoke as kindly to us as he did to his little children. We were all fond of him, and my mother loved him very much. When she saw him at the gate, she would neigh with joy and trot up to him. He would pat and stroke her and say, "Well, old Pet, and how is your little Darkey?" I was a dull black, so he called me Darkey. Then he would give me a piece of bread, which was very good, and sometimes he bought a carrot for my mother. All the horses would come to him, but I think we were his favourites. My mother always took him to town on a market day in a light gig. There was a ploughboy, Dick, who sometimes came into our field to pluck blackberries from the hedge. When he had eaten all he wanted. He would have what he called fun with the colts, throwing stones and sticks at them to make them gallop. We did not much mind him, for we could gallop off, but sometimes a stone would hit and hurt us. One day he was at this game, and did not know that the master was in the next field, but he was there, watching what was going on. Over the hedge he jumped in a snap, and catching Dick by the arm, he gave him such a box on the ear as made him roar with the pain and surprise. As soon as we saw the master, we trotted up nearer to see what went on. Bad boy, he said, bad boy to chase the colts. This is not the first time, nor the second, but it shall be the last. There, take your money and go home. I shall not want you on my farm again. So we never saw Dick any more. Old Daniel, the man who looked after the horses, was just as gentle as our master. So we were well off. End of chapter one. 
Chapter Two of Black Beauty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell. Chapter Two, The Hunt. Before I was two years old, a circumstance happened which I have never forgotten. It was early in the spring. There had been a little frost in the night, and a light mist still hung over the woods and meadows. I and the other colts were feeding at the lower part of the field, when we heard, quite in the distance, what sounded like the cry of dogs. The oldest of the colts raised his head, pricked his ears, and said, "There are the hounds," and immediately cantered off, followed by the rest of us to the upper part of the field, where we could look over the hedge. And see several fields beyond. My mother and an old riding horse of our master's were also standing near, and seemed to know all about it. They have found a hare," said my mother, "and if they come this way, we shall see the hunt." And soon the dogs were all tearing down the field of young wheat next to ours. I never heard such a noise as they made. They did not bark, nor howl, nor whine. But kept on a yo yo o o yo o o yo at the top of their voices. After them came a number of men on horseback, some of them in green coats, all galloping as fast as they could. The old horse snorted and looked eagerly after them, and we young colts wanted to be galloping with them, but they were soon away into the fields lower down. Here it seemed as if they had come to a stand. The dogs left off barking. And ran about every way with their noses to the ground. They have lost the scent," said the old horse. "Perhaps the hare will get off." "What hare?" I said. "Oh, I don't know what hare. Likely enough, it may be one of our own hares out of the woods. Any hare they can find will do for the dogs and men to run after." And before long, the dogs began their yo yo wo wo again. And back they came all together at full speed, making straight for our meadow, at the part where the high bank and hedge overhang the brook. Now we shall see the hare," said my mother. And just then, a hare, wild with fright, rushed by and made for the woods. On came the dogs. They burst over the bank, leapt the stream, and came dashing across the field, followed by the huntsmen. Six or eight men leaped their horses clean over, close upon the dogs. The hare tried to get through the fence; it was too thick, and she turned sharp round to make for the road, but it was too late. The dogs were upon her with their wild cries. We heard one shriek, and that was the end of her. One of the huntsmen rode up and whipped off the dogs, who would soon have torn her to pieces. He held her up by the leg, torn and bleeding. And all the gentlemen seemed well pleased. As for me, I was so astonished that I did not at first see what was going on by the brook, but when I did look, there was a sad sight. Two fine horses were down; one was struggling in the stream, and the other was groaning on the grass. One of the riders was getting out of the water covered with mud; the other lay quite still. His neck is broke," said my mother. And serve him right too," said one of the colts. I thought the same, but my mother did not join in with us. Well, no," she said. "You must not say that. But though I am an old horse and have seen and heard a great deal, I never yet could make out why men are so fond of this sport. They often hurt themselves, often spoil good horses, and tear up the fields, and all for a hare or a fox or a stag that they could get more easily some other way. But we are only horses and don't know. While my mother was saying this, we stood and looked on. Many of the riders had gone to the young man, but my master, who had been watching what was going on, was the first to raise him. His head fell back and his arms hung down, and every one looked very serious. There was no noise now; even the dogs were quiet and seemed to know that something was wrong. They carried him to our master's house. I heard afterward that it was young George Gordon, the squire's only son, a fine, tall young man, and the pride of his family. 
there was now riding off in all directions to the doctors, to the farriers, and no doubt to Squire Gordon's to let him know about his son. When Mr. Bond, the farrier, came to look at the black horse that lay groaning on the grass, he felt him all over, and shook his head. One of his legs was broken. Then someone ran to our master's house, and came back with a gun. Presently there was a loud bang, and a dreadful shriek, and then all was still. The black horse moved no more. My mother seemed much troubled. She said she had known that horse for years, and that his name was Rob Roy. He was a good horse, and there was no vice in him. She would never go to that part of the field afterward. Not many days after we heard the church bell tolling for a long time, and looking over the gate we saw a long, strange black coach that was covered with black cloth and was drawn by black horses. After that came another, and another, and another, and all were black, while the bell kept tolling, tolling. They were carrying young Gordon to the churchyard to bury him. He would never ride again. What they did with Rob Roy I never knew, but t'was all for one little hair. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Black Beauty This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell Chapter 3 My Breaking In I was now beginning to grow handsome. My coat had grown fine and soft, and was bright black. I had one white foot, and a pretty white star on my forehead. I was thought very handsome. My master would not sell me until I was four years old. He said lads ought not to work like men, and colts ought not to work like horses, till they were quite grown up. When I was four years old, Squire Gordon came to look at me. He examined my eyes, my mouth, and my legs. He felt them all down, and then I had to walk and trot and gallop before him. He seemed to like me, and said, When he has been well broken in, he will do very well. My master said he would break me in himself, as he should not like me to be frightened or hurt, and he lost no time about it, for the next day we began. Everyone may not know what breaking in is, therefore I will describe it. It means to teach a horse to wear a saddle and bridle, and to carry on his back a man, woman, or child, to go just the way they wish, and to go quietly. Besides this, he has to learn to wear a collar, a crupper, and a breeching, and to stand still while they are put on, then to have a cart or chaise fixed behind, so that he cannot walk or trot without dragging it behind him, and he must go fast or slow, just as his driver wishes. He must never start at what he sees, nor speak to other horses, nor bite, nor kick, nor have any will of his own, but always do his master's will, even though he be very tired or hungry. But the worst of all is, once his harness is on, he may neither jump for joy nor lie down for weariness. So you see, this breaking in is a great thing. I had of course long been used to a halter and a headstall and to be led about in the fields and lanes quietly. But now I was to have a bit and bridle. My master gave me some oats as usual, and after a good deal of coaxing, he got the bit into my mouth and the bridle fixed. But it was a nasty thing. Those who have never had a bit in their mouths cannot think how bad it feels. A great piece of cold hard steel, as thick as a man's finger, to be pushed into one's mouth, between one's teeth and over one's tongue, with the ends coming out at the corner of your mouth, and held fast there by straps over your head, under your throat, round your nose, and under your chin, so that no way in the world can you get rid of the nasty hard thing. It is very bad, yes, very bad. At least I thought so, but I knew my mother always wore one when she went out, and that all horses did when they were grown up. And so, what with the nice oats, and what with my master's pats, kind words, and gentle ways, I got to wear my bit and bridle. Next came the saddle, but that was not half so bad. My master put it on my back very gently, while old Daniel held my head. He then made the girths fast under my body, 
patting and talking to me all the time. Then I had a few oats, then a little leading about, and this he did every day, till I began to look for the oats and the saddle. At length, one morning, my master got on my back, and rode me round the meadow on the soft grass. It certainly did feel queer, but I must say I felt rather proud to carry my master, and, as he continued to ride me a little every day, I soon became accustomed to it. The next unpleasant business was putting on the iron shoes. That, too, was very hard at first. My master went with me to the smith's forge, to see that I was not hurt or got any fright. The blacksmith took my feet in his hand, one after the other, and cut away some of the hoof. It did not pain me, so I stood still on three legs till he had done them all. Then he took a piece of iron the shape of my foot, and clapped it on, and drove some nails through the shoe quite into my hoof, so that the shoe was firmly on. My feet felt very stiff and heavy, but in time I got used to it. And now, having got so far, my master went on to break me to harness. There were more new things to wear. First, a stiff heavy collar just on my neck, and a bridle with great side-pieces against my eyes called blinkers, and blinkers indeed they were, for I could not see on either side, but only straight in front of me. Next, there was a small saddle, with a nasty stiff strap that went right under my tail. That was the crupper. I hated the crupper. To have my long tail doubled up and poked through that strap was almost as bad as the bit. I never felt more like kicking, but of course I could not kick such a good master, and so in time I got used to everything, and could do my work as well as my mother. I must not forget to mention one part of my training, which I have always considered a very great advantage. My master sent me for a fortnight to a neighbouring farmer's, who had a meadow which was skirted on one side by the railway. Here were some sheep and cows, and I was turned in among them. I shall never forget the first train that ran by. I was feeding quietly near the pales which separated the meadow from the railway, when I heard a strange sound at a distance, and before I knew whence it came, with a rush and a clatter and a puffing out of smoke, a long black train of something flew by and was gone almost before I could draw my breath. I turned and galloped to the other side of the meadow as fast as I could go, and there I stood, snorting with astonishment and fear. In the course of the day many other trains went by, some more slowly, these drew up at the station close by, and sometimes made an awful shriek and groan before they stopped. I thought it very dreadful, but the cows went on eating very quietly, and hardly raised their heads as the black frightful thing came puffing and grinding past. For the first few days I could not feed in peace, but as I found that this terrible creature never came into the field, or did me any harm, I began to disregard it, and very soon I cared as little about the passing of a train as the cows and sheep did. Since then I have seen many horses much alarmed and restive at the sight or sound of a steam engine, but thanks to my good master's care, I am as fearless at railway stations as in my own stable. Now, if anyone wants to break in a young horse well, that is the way. My master often drove me in double harness with my mother, because she was steady and could teach me how to go better than a strange horse. She told me the better I behaved, the better I should be treated, and that it was wisest always to do my best to please my master. But said she, there are a great many kinds of men. There are good, thoughtful men, like our master, that any horse may be proud to serve, and there are bad, cruel men, who never ought to have a horse or dog to call their own. Besides, there are a great many foolish men, vain, ignorant, and careless, who never trouble themselves to think. These spoil more horses than all, just for want of sense. They don't mean it but they do it for all that. I hope you will fall into good hands, but a horse never knows who may buy him, or who may drive him. It is all a chance for us, but still I say, do your best, wherever it is, and keep up your good name. End of chapter 3 
Chapter Four of Black Beauty. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell. Chapter Four, Berthwick Park. At this time, I used to stand in the stable, and my coat was brushed every day until it shone like a rook's wing. It was early in May when there came a man from Squire Gordon's who took me away to the hall. My master said, "Goodbye, Darkey." Be a good horse and always do your best. I could not say goodbye, so I put my nose into his hand. He patted me kindly, and I left my first home. As I lived some years with Squire Gordon, I may as well tell something about the place. Squire Gordon's park skirted the village of Birtwick. It was entered by a large iron gate, at which stood the first lodge, and then you trotted along on a smooth road. Between clumps of large old trees, then another lodge and another gate, which brought you to the house and the gardens. Beyond this lay the home paddock, the old orchard, and the stables. There was accommodation for many horses and carriages, but I need only describe the stable into which I was taken. This was very roomy, with four good stalls, a large swinging window opened into the yard. Which made it pleasant and airy. The first stall was a large square one, shut in behind with a wooden gate. The others were common stalls, good stalls, but not nearly so large. It had a low rack for hay and a low manger for corn. It was called a loose box, because the horse that was put into it was not tied up, but left loose to do as he liked. It is a great thing to have a loose box. Into this fine box the groom put me. It was clean, sweet, and airy. I never was in a better box than that, and the sides were not so high but that I could see all that went on through the iron rails that were at the top. He gave me some very nice oats. He patted me, spoke kindly, and then went away. When I had eaten my corn, I looked around. In the stall next to mine stood a little fat grey pony with a thick mane and tail, a very pretty head. And a pert little nose. I put my head up to the iron rails at the top of my box and said, "How do you do? What is your name?" He turned round as far as his halter would allow, held up his head, and said, "My name is Merrylegs. I am very handsome. I carry the young ladies on my back, and sometimes I take our mistress out in the low chair. They think a great deal of me, and so does James. Are you going to live next door to me in the box?" I said, "Yes." Well then, he said, "I hope you are good-tempered. I do not like any one next door who bites." Just then, a horse's head looked over from the stall beyond. The ears were laid back, and the eye looked rather ill-tempered. This was a tall chestnut mare with a long, handsome neck. She looked across to me and said, "So it is you who have turned me out of my box. It is a very strange thing for a colt like you to come." And turn a lady out of her own home. I beg your pardon," I said. "I have turned no one out. The man who brought me put me here, and I had nothing to do with it. And as to my being a colt, I am turned four years old, and am a grown-up horse. I never had words yet with horse or mare, and it is my wish to live at peace. Well," she said, "we shall see. Of course, I do not want to have words with a young thing like you." I said no more. In the afternoon, when she went out, Merrylegs told me all about it. The thing is this," said Merrylegs. "Ginger has a bad habit of biting and snapping. That is why they call her Ginger. And when she was in the loose box, she used to snap very much. One day she bit James in the arm and made it bleed, and so Miss Flora and Miss Jessie, who were very fond of me, were afraid to come into the stable." They used to bring me nice things to eat, an apple or a carrot or a piece of bread, but after Ginger stood in that box, they dared not come, and I missed them very much. I hope they will now come again if you do not bite or snap. I told him I never bit anything but grass, hay, and corn, and could not think what pleasure Ginger found it. Well, I don't think she does find pleasure," says Merrylegs. "It is just a bad habit." She says no one was ever kind to her, and why should she not bite? 
Of course, it is a very bad habit, but I am sure, if all she says be true, she must have been very ill-used before she came here. John does all he can to please her, and James does all he can, and our master never uses a whip if a horse acts right, so I think she might be good-tempered here. You see, he said, with a wise look, I am twelve years old. I know a great deal, and I can tell you there is not a better place for a horse all round the country than this. John is the best groom that ever was. He has been here fourteen years, and you never saw such a kind boy as James is, so that it is all Ginger's own fault that she did not stay in that box. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Black Beauty This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell Chapter 5 A Fair Start The name of the coachman was John Manley. He had a wife and one little child, and they lived in the coachman's cottage, very near the stables. The next morning he took me into the yard and gave me a good grooming, and just as I was going into my box with my coat soft and bright, the squire came in to look at me, and seemed pleased. John, he said, I meant to have tried the new horse this morning, but I have other business. You may as well take him around after breakfast. Go by the common and the highwood, and back by the watermill and the river. That will show his paces. I will, sir, said John. After breakfast he came and fitted me with a bridle. He was very particular in letting out and taking in the straps to fit my head comfortably. Then he bought a saddle but it was not broad enough for my back. He saw it in a minute, and went for another, which fitted nicely. He rode me first slowly, then a trot, then a canter, and when we were on the common he gave me a light touch with his whip, and we had a splendid gallop. "'Ho, ho, my boy,' he said, as he pulled me up. "'You would like to follow the hounds, I think.' As we came back through the park we met the squire and Mrs. Gordon walking. They stopped, and John jumped off. "'Well, John, how does he go?' First rate sir,' answered John. "'He is as fleet as a deer, and has a fine spirit, too. "'But the lightest touch of the rain will guide him. "'Down at the end of the common we met one of those travelling carts, "'hung all over with baskets, rugs, and such like. "'You know, sir, many horses will not pass those carts quietly. "'He just took a good look at it, and then went on as quiet and pleasant as could be. "'They were shooting rabbits near the highwood, and a gun went off close by. "'He pulled up a little, and looked.' but did not stir a step to right or left. I just held the rein steady and did not hurry him, and it's my opinion he has not been frightened or ill-used while he was young. "'That's well,' said the squire. "'I will try him myself to-morrow.' The next day I was brought up for my master. I remembered my mother's counsel, and my good old master's, and I tried to do exactly what he wanted me to do. I found he was a very good rider, and thoughtful for his horse, too. When he came home, the lady was at the hall door as he rode up. "'Well, my dear,' she said, "'how do you like him?' "'He is exactly what John said,' he replied. "'A pleasanter creature I never wish to mount. "'What shall we call him?' "'Would you like Ebony?' said she. "'He is as black as Ebony.' "'No, not Ebony.' "'Will you call him Blackbird, like your uncle's old horse?' "'No. He is far handsomer than old Blackbird ever was. Yes, she said, he really is quite a beauty, and he has such a sweet, good-tempered face, and such a fine, intelligent eye. What do you say to calling him Black Beauty? Black Beauty? Why, yes, I think that is a very good name. If you like it shall be his name. And so it was. When John went into the stable, he told James that master and mistress had chosen a good, sensible English name for me that meant something, not like Marengo or Pegasus or Abdallah. They both laughed, and James said, If it was not for bringing back the past, I should have named him Robroy, for I never saw two horses more alike. That's no wonder, said John. Didn't you know that Farmer Gray's old Duchess was the mother of them both? I had never heard that before. And so poor Rob Roy, who was killed at that hunt, was my brother. I did not wonder that my mother was so troubled. It seems that horses have no relations, 
At least they never know each other after they are sold. John seemed very proud of me. He used to make my mane and tail almost as smooth as a lady's hair, and he would talk to me a great deal. Of course I did not understand all he said, but I learned more and more to know what he meant, and what he wanted me to do. I grew very fond of him. He was so gentle and kind. He seemed to know just how a horse feels, and when he cleaned me he knew the tender places and the ticklish places. When he brushed my head he went as carefully over my eyes as if they were his own, and never stirred up any ill temper. James Howard, the stable boy, was just as gentle and pleasant in his way, so I thought myself well off. There was another man who helped in the yard, but he had very little to do with Ginger and me. A few days after this I had to go out with Ginger in the carriage. I wondered how we should get on together, but except laying her ears back when I was led up to her, she behaved very well. She did her work honestly, and did her full share, and I never wished to have a better partner in double harness. When we came to a hill, instead of slackening her pace, she would throw her weight right into the collar and pull away straight up. We had both the same sort of courage at our work, and John had oftener to hold us in than to urge us forward. He never had to use the whip with either of us. Then our paces were much the same, and I found it very easy to keep step with her when trotting, which made it pleasant, and Master always liked it when we kept step well, and so did John. After we had been out two or three times together, we grew quite friendly and sociable, which made me feel very much at home. As for Merrylegs, he and I soon became great friends. He was such a cheerful, plucky, good-tempered little fellow that he was a favourite with every one, and especially with Miss Jessie and Flora, who used to ride him about in the orchard and have fine games with him and their little dog Frisky. Our master had two other horses that stood in another stable. One was Justice, a roan cob, used for riding or for the luggage cart. The other was an old brown hunter named Sir Oliver. He was past work now, but was a great favourite with the master, who gave him the run of the park. He sometimes did a little light carting on the estate, or carried one of the young ladies when they rode out with their father, for he was very gentle, and could be trusted with a child as well as merry legs. The cob was a strong, well-made, good-tempered horse, and we sometimes had a little chat in the paddock, but of course I could not be so intimate with him as with Ginger, who stood in the same stable. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Black Beauty This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell Chapter 6 Liberty I was quite happy in my new place, and if there was one thing I missed, it must not be thought I was discontented. All who had to do with me were good, and I had a light, airy stable, and the best of food. What more could I want? Why, liberty! For three years and a half of my life I had had all the liberty I could wish for, but now, week after week, month after month, and no doubt year after year, I must stand up in a stable night and day, except when I am wanted, and then I must be just as steady and quiet as any old horse who has worked twenty years. Straps here and straps there, a bit in my mouth and blinkers over my eyes. Now, I am not complaining, for I know it must be so. I only mean to say that for a young horse, full of strength and spirits, who has been used to some large field or plain, where he can fling up his head and toss up his tail and gallop away at full speed, and then round and back again with a snort to his companions, I say it is hard never to have a bit more liberty to do as you like. Sometimes, when I have had less exercise than usual, I have felt so full of life and spring that when John has taken me out to exercise, I really could not keep quiet. Do what I would, it seemed as if I must jump or dance or prance, and many a good shake I know I must have given him, especially at the first, but he was always good and patient. "'Steady, steady, my boy,' he would say. "'Wait a bit, and we will have a good swing, and soon get the tickle out of your feet.' Then, as soon as we were out of the village, he would give me a few miles at a spanking trot, and then bring me back as fresh as before, only clear of the fidgets, as he called them. Spirited horses, 
when not enough exercised, are often called skittish, when it is only play, and some grooms will punish them. But our John did not. He knew it was only high spirits. Still, he had his own ways of making me understand by the tone of his voice or the touch of the rein. If he was very serious and quite determined, I always knew it by his voice, and that had more power with me than anything else, for I was very fond of him. I ought to say that sometimes we had our liberty for a few hours. This used to be on fine Sundays in the summer time. The carriage never went out on Sundays, because the church was not far off. It was a great treat to us to be turned out into the home paddock or the old orchard. The grass was so cool and soft to our feet, the air so sweet, and the freedom to do as we liked was so pleasant. To gallop, to lie down and roll over on our backs, or to nibble the sweet grass. Then it was a very good time for talking, as we stood together under the shade of the large chestnut tree. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Black Beauty This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell Chapter 7 Ginger One day, when Ginger and I were standing alone in the shade, we had a great deal of talk. She wanted to know all about my bringing up and breaking in, and I told her. Well, said she, if I had had your bringing up, I might have had as good a temper as you, but now I don't believe I ever shall. Why not? I said. Because it has all been so different with me, she replied. I never had any one, horse or man, that was kind to me, or that I cared to please, for in the first place I was taken from my mother as soon as I was weaned, and put in with a lot of other young colts. None of them cared for me, and I cared for none of them. There was no kind master like yours to look after me, and talk to me, and bring me nice things to eat. The man that had the care of us never gave me a kind word in my life. I do not mean that he ill-used me, but he did not care for us one bit further than to see that we had plenty to eat, and shelter in the winter. A footpath ran through our field, and very often the great boys passing through would fling stones to make us gallop. I was never hit, but one fine young colt was badly cut in the face, and I should think it would be a scar for life. We did not care for them, but of course it made us more wild, and we settled it in our minds that boys were our enemies. We had very good fun in the free meadows, galloping up and down and chasing each other round and round the field, then standing still under the shade of the trees. But when it came to breaking in, that was a bad time for me. Several men came to catch me, and when at last they closed me in at one corner of the field, one caught me by the forelock, another caught me by the nose, and held it so tight I could hardly draw my breath. Then another took my underjaw in his hard hand and wrenched my mouth open, and so by force they got on the halter and the bar into my mouth. Then one dragged me along by the halter, another flogging behind, and this was the first experience I had of men's kindness. It was all force. They did not give me a chance to know what they wanted. I was high-bred and had a great deal of spirit, and was very wild, no doubt, and gave them, I dare say, plenty of trouble. But then it was dreadful to be shut up in a stall day after day, instead of having my liberty, and I fretted and pined and wanted to get loose. You know yourself it's bad enough when you have a kind master and plenty of coaxing, but there was nothing of that sort for me. There was one, the old master, Mr. Ryder, who I think could soon have brought me round, and could have done anything with me. But he had given up all the hard part of the trade to his son and to another experienced man, and he only came at times to oversee. His son was a strong, tall, bold man. They called him Samson, and he used to boast that he had never found a horse that could throw him. There was no gentleness in him, as there was in his father, but only hardness, a hard voice, a hard eye, a hard hand, and I felt from the first that what he wanted was to wear all the spirit out of me, and just make me into a quiet, humble, obedient piece of horse-flesh. Horse-flesh! Yes, that is all he thought about. And Ginger stamped her foot, as if the very thought of him made her angry. Then she went on. If I did not do exactly what he wanted, he would get put out, and make me run round with that long rein in the training field, till he had tired me out. I think he drank a good deal, 
and I am quite sure that the oftener he drank, the worse it was for me. One day he had worked me hard in every way he could, and when I lay down I was tired and miserable and angry. It all seemed so hard. The next morning he came for me early, and ran me round again for a long time. I had scarcely an hour's rest, when he came again for me with a saddle and bridle, and a new kind of bit. I could never quite tell how it came about. He had only just mounted me on the training-ground, when something I did put him out of temper, and he chucked me hard with the rein. The new bit was very painful, and I reared up suddenly, which angered him still more, and he began to flog me. I felt my whole spirit set against him, and I began to kick and plunge and rear as I had never done before, and we had a regular fight. For a long time he stuck to the saddle, and punished me cruelly with his whip and spurs, but my blood was thoroughly up, and I cared for nothing he could do, if only I could get him off. At last, after a terrible struggle, I threw him off backward. I heard him fall heavily on the turf, and without looking behind me I galloped off to the other end of the field. There I turned round, and saw my persecutor slowly rising from the ground, and going into the stable. I stood under an oak tree and watched, but no one came to catch me. The time went on, and the sun was very hot. The flies swarmed around me, and settled on my bleeding flanks where the spurs had dug in. I felt hungry, for I had not eaten since the early morning, but there was not enough grass in that meadow for a goose to live on. I wanted to lie down and rest, but with the saddle strapped tightly on there was no comfort, and there was not a drop of water to drink. The afternoon wore on, and the sun got low. I saw the other colts led in, and I knew they were having a good feed. At last, just as the sun went down, I saw the old master come out with a sieve in his hand. He was a very fine old gentleman, with quite white hair, but his voice was what I should know him by among a thousand. It was not high, nor yet low, but full, and clear, and kind, and when he gave orders it was so steady and decided that every one knew, both horses and men, that he expected to be obeyed. He came quietly along, now and then shaking the oats about that he had in the sieve, and speaking cheerfully and gently to me. Come along, lassie, come along, lassie, come along, come along. I stood still, and let him come up. He held the oats to me, and I began to eat without fear. His voice took all my fear away. He stood by, patting and stroking me while I was eating, and seeing the clots of blood on my side he seemed very vexed. Poor lassie! It was a bad business, a bad business. Then he quietly took the rein and led me to the stable. Just at the door stood Samson. I laid my ears back and snapped at him. "'Stand back,' said the master, "'and keep out of her way. You've done a bad day's work for this filly.' He growled out something about a vicious brute. "'Hark ye,' said the father, "'a bad-tempered man will never make a good-tempered horse. You've not learned your trade yet, Samson.' Then he led me into my box, took off the saddle and bridle with his own hands, and tied me up. Then he called for a pail of warm water and a sponge, took off his coat, and while the stable-man held the pail, he sponged my sides a good while, so tenderly that I was sure he knew how bruised and sore they were. "'Whoa, my pretty one,' he said, "'stand still, stand still.' His very voice did me good, and the bathing was very comfortable. The skin was so broken at the corners of my mouth that I could not eat the hay, the stalks hurt me. He looked closely at it, shook his head, and told the man to fetch a good bran mash, and put some meal into it. How good that mash was! and so soft and healing to my mouth. He stood by all the time I was eating, stroking me and talking to the man. "'If a high-mettled creature like this,' said he, "'can't be broken by fair means, she will never be good for anything.' After that he often came to see me, and when my mouth was healed the other breaker, Job they called him, went on training me. He was steady and thoughtful, and I soon learned what he wanted. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Black Beauty This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell 
Chapter Eight, Ginger's Story Continued. The next time that Ginger and I were together at the paddock, she told me about her first place. After my breaking in, she said, I was bought by a dealer to match another chestnut horse. For some weeks he drove us together, and then we were sold to a fashionable gentleman and were sent up to London. I had been driven with a check rein by the dealer, and I hated it worse than anything else. But in this place we were reined far tighter, the coachman and his master thinking we looked more stylish so. We were often driven about in the park and other fashionable places. You who have never had a check rein on don't know what it is, but I can tell you it is dreadful. I like to toss my head about and hold it as high as any horse, but fancy now yourself if you tossed your head up high. And were obliged to hold it there, and that for hours together, not able to move it at all, except with a jerk still higher, your neck aching till you did not know how to bear it. Besides that, to have two bits instead of one, and mine was a sharp one, it hurt my tongue and my jaw, and the blood from my tongue coloured the froth that kept flying from my lips as I chafed and fretted at the bits and rein. It was worst when we had to stand by the hour, waiting for our mistress at some grand party or entertainment. And if I fretted or stamped with impatience, the whip was laid on. It was enough to drive one mad. Did not your master take any thought for you? I said. No, said she. He only cared to have a stylish turnout, as they call it. I think he knew very little about horses. He left that to his coachman, who told him I had an irritable temper, that I had not been well broken to the check rein, but I should soon get used to it. But he was not the man to do it. For when I was in the stable, miserable and angry, instead of being smoothed and quieted by kindness, I got only a surly word or a blow. If he had been civil, I would have tried to bear it. I was willing to work and ready to work hard too, but to be tormented for nothing but their fancies angered me. What right had they to make me suffer like that? Besides, the soreness in my mouth and the pain in my neck, it always made my windpipe feel bad. And if I had stopped there long, I know it would have spoiled my breathing. But I grew more and more restless and irritable. I could not help it, and I began to snap and kick when any one came to harness me. For this, the groom beat me. And one day, as they had just buckled us into the carriage and were straining my head up with that rein, I began to plunge and kick with all my might. I soon broke a lot of harness and kicked myself clear. So that was an end of that place. After this, I was sent to Tattersalls to be sold. Of course, I could not be warranted free from vice, so nothing was said about that. My handsome appearance and good paces soon brought a gentleman to bid for me, and I was bought by another dealer. He tried me in all kinds of ways and with different bits, and he soon found out what I could not bear. At last, he drove me quite without a check rein, and then sold me as a perfectly quiet horse to a gentleman in the country. He was a good master. And I was getting on very well, but his old groom left him, and a new one came. This man was as hard-tempered and hard-handed as Samson. He always spoke in a rough, impatient voice, and if I did not move in the stall the moment he wanted me, he would hit me above the hocks with his stable broom or the fork, whichever he might have in his hand. Everything he did was rough, and I began to hate him. He wanted to make me afraid of him, but I was too high-mettled for that. And one day, when he had aggravated me more than usual, I bit him, which of course put him in a great rage, and he began to hit me about the head with a riding whip. After that, he never dared to come into my stall again. Either my heels or my teeth were ready for him, and he knew it. I was quite quiet with my master, but of course he listened to what the man said, and so I was sold again. The same dealer heard of me, and said he thought he knew one place where I should do well. It was a pity, he said, that such a fine horse should go to the bad for want of a real good chance, and the end of it was that I came here not long before you did. But I had then made up my mind that men were my natural enemies, and that I must defend myself. Of course, it is very different here, but who knows how long it will last? I wish I could think about things as you do, but I can't. After all, I have gone through. Well, I said. I think it would be a real shame if you were to bite or kick John or James. I don't mean to," she said. "While they are good to me, I did bite James once pretty sharp, but John said, 'Try her with kindness,' and instead of punishing me as I expected, 
James came to me with his arm bound up, and brought me a bran mash, and stroked me. And I have never snapped at him since, and I won't either. I was sorry for Ginger, but of course I knew very little then, and I thought most likely she made the worst of it. However, I found that as the weeks went on she grew more gentle and cheerful, and had lost the watchful defiant look that she used to turn on any strange person who came near her. And one day James said, I do believe that mare is getting quite fond of me. She quite whinnied after me this morning when I had been rubbing her forehead. Ay, ay, Jim, tis the Birtwick balls, said John. She'll be as good as Black Beauty by and by. Kindness is all the physic she wants, poor thing. Master noticed the change, too, and one day when he got out of the carriage and came to speak to us, as he often did, he stroked her beautiful neck. Well, my pretty one, well, how do things go with you now? You are a good bit happier than when you came to us, I think. She put her nose up to him in a friendly, trustful way, while he rubbed it gently. We shall make a cure of her, John, he said. Yes, sir, she's wonderfully improved. She's not the same creature that she was. It's the Birtwick ball, sir, said John, laughing. This was a little joke of John's. He used to say that a regular course of the Birtwick horse balls would cure almost any vicious horse. These balls, he said, were made up of patience and gentleness, firmness and petting, one pound of each to be mixed up with half a pint of common sense, and given to the horse every day. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Black Beauty This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell Chapter 9 Merry Legs. Mr. Bloomfield, the vicar, had a large family of boys and girls. Sometimes they used to come and play with Miss Jessie and Flora. One of the girls was as old as Miss Jessie, two of the boys were older, and there were several little ones. When they came there was plenty of work for Merry Legs, for nothing pleased them so much as getting on him by turns, and riding him all about the orchard and the home paddock, and this they would do by the hour together. One afternoon he had been out with them a long time, and when James brought him in and put on his halter he said, "'There, you rogue, mind how you behave yourself or we shall get into trouble.' "'What have you been doing, Merry Legs? I asked. "'Oh,' said he, tossing his little head, "'I have only been giving those young people a lesson. They did not know when they had had enough, nor when I had had enough, so I just pitched them off backward. That was the only thing they could understand.' "'What?' said I. You threw the children off? I thought you knew better than that. Did you throw Miss Jessie or Miss Flora?" He looked very much offended, and said, "'Of course not. I would not do such a thing for the best oats that ever came into the stable. Why, I am as careful of our young ladies as the master could be, and as for the little ones it is I who teach them to ride. When they seem frightened or a little unsteady on my back, I go as smooth and as quiet as old pussy when she is after a bird, and when they are all right, I go on again faster, you see, just to use them to it. So don't you trouble yourself preaching to me. I am the best friend and the best riding-master those children have. It is not them, it is the boys. Boys, said he, shaking his mane, are quite different. They must be broken in as we were broken in where we were colts, and just be taught what's what. The other children had ridden me about for nearly two hours, and then the boys thought that it was their turn, and so it was, and I was quite agreeable. They rode me by turns, and I galloped them about, up and down the fields and all about the orchard, for a good hour. They had each cut a great hazel stick for a riding whip, and laid it on a little too hard, but I took it in good part, till at last I thought we had had enough, so I stopped two or three times by way of a hint. Boys, you see, think a horse or a pony is like a steam-engine or a thrashing-machine, and can go on as long and as fast as they please. They never think that a pony can get tired, or have any feelings. So, as the one who was whipping me could not understand, I just rose up on my hind legs and let him slip off behind. That was all. He mounted me again, and I did the same. Then the other boy got on, and as soon as he began to use his stick, I laid him on the grass, and so on till they were able to understand. That was all. They are not bad boys. They don't wish to be cruel. I like them very well, but you see I had to give them a lesson. 
When they brought me to James and told him, I think he was very angry to see such big sticks. He said they were only fit for drovers or gypsies, and not for young gentlemen. Had I been you, said Ginger, I would have given those boys a good kick, and that would have given them a lesson. No doubt you would, said Merrylegs, but then I am not quite such a fool, begging your pardon, as to anger our master or make James ashamed of me. Besides, those children are under my charge when they are riding. I tell you they are entrusted to me. Why, only the other day I heard our master say to Mrs. Bloomfield, My dear madam, you need not be anxious about the children. My old merry legs will take as much care of them as you or I could. I assure you I would not sell that pony for any money. He is so perfectly good-tempered and trustworthy. And do you think I am such an ungrateful brute as to forget all the kind treatment I have had here for five years, and all the trust that they place in me, and turn vicious because a couple of ignorant boys used me badly? No, no. You never had a good place where they were kind to you, and so you don't know, and I'm sorry for you. But I can tell you good places make good horses. I wouldn't vex our people for anything. I love them, I do, said Mary Legs, and he gave a low ho 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 through his nose, as he used to do in the morning when he heard James's footstep at the door. Besides, he went on, if I took to kicking, where should I be? Why, sold off in a jiffy, and no character. And I might find myself slaved about under a butcher's boy, or worked to death at some seaside place where no one cared for me, except to find out how fast I could go, or be flogged along in some cart with three or four great men in it going out for a Sunday spree, as I have often seen in the place I lived in before I came here. No, said he, shaking his head, I hope I shall never come to that. End of chapter nine. Public domain. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell. Chapter Ten. A Talk in the Orchard. Ginger and I were not of the regular tall carriage horse breed. We had more of the racing blood in us. We stood about fifteen and a half hands high. We were therefore just as good for riding as we were for driving, and our master used to say that he disliked either horse or man that could do but one thing. And as he did not want to show off in London parks, he preferred a more active and useful kind of horse. As for us, our greatest pleasure was when we were saddled for a riding party, the master on Ginger, the mistress on me, and the young ladies on Sir Oliver and Merrylegs. It was so cheerful to be trotting and cantering all together that it always put us in high spirits. I had the best of it, for I always carried the mistress. Her weight was little. Her voice was sweet, and her hand was so light on the rein that I was guided almost without feeling it. Oh, if people knew what a comfort to horses a light hand is, and how it keeps a good mouth and a good temper, they surely would not chuck and drag and pull at the rein as they often do. Our mouths are so tender that where they have not been spoiled or hardened with bad or ignorant treatment, they feel the slightest movement of the driver's hand. And we know in an instant what is required of us. My mouth has never been spoiled, and I believe that was why the mistress preferred me to Ginger, although her paces were certainly quite as good. She used often to envy me, and said it was all the fault of breaking in, and the gag bit in London, that her mouth was not so perfect as mine. And then old Sir Oliver would say, "There, there, don't vex yourself. You have the greatest honour." A mare that can carry a tall man of our master's weight, with all your spring and sprightly action, does not need to hold her head down because she does not carry the lady. We horses must take things as they come, and always be contented and willing so long as we are kindly used. I had often wondered how it was that Sir Oliver had such a very short tail. It was really only six or seven inches long, with a tassel of hair hanging from it, and on one of our holidays in the orchard. I ventured to ask him by what accident it was that he had lost his tail. Accident, he snorted with a fierce look. It was no accident. It was a cruel, shameful, cold-blooded act. When I was young, I was taken to a place where these cruel things were done. I was tied up and made fast so that I could not stir, and then they came and cut off my long and beautiful tail through the flesh and through the bone. 
and took it away. "'How dreadful!' I exclaimed. "'Dreadful! Ah, oh, it was dreadful! But it was not only the pain, though that was terrible and lasted a long time. It was not only the indignity of having my best ornament taken from me, though that was bad. But it was this. How could I ever brush the flies off my sides and my hind legs any more? You who have tails just whisk the flies off without thinking about it, and you can't tell what a torment it is to have them settle upon you and sting and sting, and have nothing in the world to lash them off with. I tell you, it is a lifelong wrong and a lifelong loss, but thank heaven they don't do it now." "'What do they do it for, then?' said Ginger. "'For fashion,' said the old horse, with a stamp of his foot. "'For fashion. If you know what that means, there was not a well-bred young horse in my time that had not his tail docked in that shameful way, just as if the good God that made us did not know what we wanted and what looked best. I suppose it is fashion that makes them strap our heads up with those horrid bits that I was tortured with in London," said Ginger. "'Of course it is,' said he. "'To my mind, fashion is one of the wickedest things in the world. Now look, for instance, at the way they serve dogs, cutting off their tails to make them look plucky, and shearing up their pretty little ears to a point to make them both look sharp, forsooth. I had a dear friend once, a brown terrier, Sky they called her. She was so fond of me that she would never sleep out of my stall. She made her bed under the manger, and there she had a litter of five as pretty little puppies as need be. None were drowned, for they were a valuable kind, and how pleased she was with them! And when they got their eyes open and crawled about, it was a real pretty sight. But one day the man came, and took them all away. I thought he might be afraid I should tread upon them. But it was not so. In the evening poor Skye brought them back again one by one in her mouth, not the happy little things that they were, but bleeding and crying pitifully. They had all had a piece of their tails cut off, and the soft flap of their pretty little ears was cut quite off. How their mother licked them, and how troubled she was, poor thing! I never forgot it. They healed in time, and they forgot the pain, but the nice soft flap, that of course was intended to protect the delicate part of their ears from dust and injury, was gone for ever. Why don't they cut their own children's ears into points to make them look sharp? Why don't they cut the end off their noses to make them look plucky? One would be just as sensible as the other. What right have they to torment and disfigure God's creatures?" Sir Oliver, though he was so gentle, was a fiery old fellow, and what he said was all so new to me and so dreadful that I found a bitter feeling towards men rise up in my mind that I had never had before. Of course Ginger was very much excited. She flung up her head with flashing eyes and distended nostrils, declaring that men were both brutes and blockheads. "'Who talks about blockheads?' said Merrylegs, who had just come up from the old apple-tree, where he had been rubbing himself against the low branch. "'Who talks about blockheads? I believe that is a bad word.' "'Bad words were made for bad things,' said Ginger and she told him what Sir Oliver had said. "'It is all true,' said Merrylegs, sadly, "'and I have seen that about the dogs over and over again where I lived first, but we won't talk about it here. You know that Master and John and James are always good to us, and talking against men in such a place as this doesn't seem fair or grateful, and you know there are good masters and good grooms beside ours, though of course ours are the best.' This wise speech of good little Merrylegs, which we knew was quite true, cooled us all down, especially Sir Oliver, who was dearly fond of his master. And to turn the subject I said, "'Can any one tell me the use of blinkers?' "'No,' said Sir Oliver shortly, "'because they are no use.' "'They are supposed,' said Justice, the roan cob, in his calm way, "'to prevent horses from shying and starting and getting so frightened as to cause accidents. Then what is the reason they do not put them on riding horses, especially on ladies' horses?" said I. There is no reason at all, said he quietly, except the fashion. They say that a horse would be so frightened to see the wheels of his own cart or carriage coming behind him 
that he would be sure to run away, although, of course, when he is ridden he sees them all about him if the streets are crowded. I admit they do sometimes come too close to be pleasant, but we don't run away. We are used to it, and understand it. And if we never had blinkers put on, we should never want them. We should see what was there, and know what was what, and be much less frightened than by only seeing bits of things that we can't understand. Of course, there may be some nervous horses who have been hurt or frightened when they were young, who may be the better for them, but as I was never nervous, I can't judge. I consider, said Sir Oliver, that blinkers are dangerous things in the night. We horses can see much better in the dark than men can, and many an accident would never have happened if horses might have had the full use of their eyes. Some years ago, I remember, there was a hearse with two horses returning one dark night, and just by Farmer Sparrow's house, where the pond is close to the road, the wheels went too near the edge, and the hearse was overdrowned into the water. Both the horses were drowned, and the driver hardly escaped. Of course, after this accident, a stout white rail was put up that might be easily seen, but if those horses had not been partly blinded, they would have themselves kept further from the edge, and no accident would have happened. When our master's carriage was overturned, before you came here, it was said that if the lamp on the left side had not gone out, John would have seen the great hole that the roadmakers had left. And so he might, but if old Colin had not had blinkers on, he would have seen it, lamp or no lamp, for he was far too knowing an old horse to run into danger. As it was, he was very much hurt, the carriage was broken, and how John escaped nobody knew. I should say, said Ginger, curling her nostril, that these men, who were so wise, had better give orders that in the future all foals should be born with their eyes set just in the middle of their foreheads, instead of on the side. They always think they can improve upon nature and mend what God has made. Things were getting rather sore again, when Merrylegs held up his knowing little face and said, I'll tell you a secret. I believe John does not approve of blinkers. I heard him talking with Master about it one day. The Master said that, if horses had been used to them, it might be dangerous in some cases to leave them off. And John said he thought it would be a good thing if all colts were broken in without blinkers, as was the case in some foreign countries. So let us cheer up, and have a run to the other end of the orchard. I believe the wind has blown down some apples, and we might just as well eat them as the slugs. Merrylegs could not be resisted, so we broke off our long conversation and got up our spirits by munching some very sweet apples, which lay scattered on the grass. End of chapter 10